Uh, I'm a local person. I grew up in Concord, uh, which is on the other side of the tunnel. Uh, and I went to uh, school out there in high school and elementary school. And um, I was uh, not a good student. I was not a pretty terrible student. And I, um, instead of being in class, I spent most of my time drawing and painting. Uh, I spent hours and hours drawing things. And I would pick things up and study them and try to draw them and take things apart. And I got Lego and played around with Lego and spent all my time doing that and not my schoolwork, unfortunately. Uh, and it was impressed, impressed upon my parents that if I didn't do at least something in school, that um, I would be in trouble uh, academically. And, uh, and they tried to get me to do things in school, and I just would not do it. Um, and, but I could do the work. And, and uh, they'd always say, you know, like that's what I say to my son, is like, you're really bright. <sighs> you're just not motivated to do anything. So, uh, but I continued on that path, and I would spend uh, my, my day consisted of going to the library and reading books. I picked up volumes of books on anything I could read, and I would read it. And then I would, um, at night I would go home, and I would, I would buy something at the store, or some model or something like that, and take it apart and put it together. That's, that's basically what I like to do. Um, and so, uh, just a couple of things. I got an award when I was uh, nine years old for redesigning a toy. Um, and I did things like that. I like to grab things and play around. And um, in high school, uh, my performance deteriorated, and I spent more and more time. I spent time in the metal shop and wood shop. I spent time working on my car, my bicycle, and everything I could get my hands on that involved like dexterity and studying things. I like doing that. And um, and so I just sort of bummed around after school and for a couple of years, and and then I said, well, I got to do something with myself because I could. I was obviously had something going on, and I couldn't figure out exactly what it was. Um, but I decided I just I could try college and, and try out. So I went to DBC and, and uh, studied there. I took mechanical engineering, math, science, stuff like that. And I was pretty confident at it. And, uh, and I said, well, I've got to figure out what I'm going to do after DBC. And I got Stanford. I had two options. I want to stay here because I live here. And I got Stanford and Berkeley, so I applied above. Well, about that time, I got uh, a job at working with um, the government. Um, I was an engineer. I think I was an engineer. I was a sort of a you know, tech tech engineer, but I got pretty confident. I was doing pretty soon I could understand more about the systems that the engineers were working on than the engineers did themselves. And I was able to put these systems together in my head and organize them. And so they decided that I would probably be a, a good spot there. So I got a scholarship, and I, and I got a scholarship at Berkeley. And uh, they paid the full scholarship. I got all my living expenses and, and my cost of the tuition, which was not much. It was like 24 bucks a year back then. But, um, so when I got to Berkeley, uh, I was soon overwhelmed with the workload because I could no longer really do the kinds of things that you guys can do in your startup labs here. That's what I really, really like to do. I like to take things apart and play around with them. And, I, uh, I couldn't really do that, so I just sort of would do the academics, so I did the academics, and, and then I realized there was actually a place in Quarry Hall where I could go and play around with things. And of course, there were grad students in there, so I met this guy in Max House, where he was a grad student, PhD student at Berkeley. I said, I want to come in here and work, and he goes, you can come in here and work, but you have to do what I tell you to do. And so I said, okay, I'll do, do what you ask. And through Max, I met a guy named Burlicamp, who was a professor here. Worked with him and Max, and then Burlicamp hired me when I graduated, and we went to a startup, to a startup company. And this startup company was a, uh, a company that did film stuff, digital film and coding. And so I built the very first digital film system with him. And I didn't know anything about digital electronics. I just picked it up one day and just said, well, I'm going to do that. And I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't know about timing and sequencing and, and, uh, and state machines and race conditions. I learned all that on the job because <laughs> I was an analog engineer, analog engineering student here. So how did I end up where I am today? Um, I ended up because, where I'm today. so I have a story. There was a guy from Oculus. We found this, I got these, this really weird math problem. You know, you know what a quaternion is? Some of you? Okay. This is a singularity problem, and uh, with you know using radians or degrees, and I don't want to get into it, but we have to write 
this IMU code and then take the IMU code and port it into the game, and no one knows how to do it and do the translations. So I got on the line and I said, who is the world's leading quaternion expert? And this guy's name popped up, and I called him. He was a professor at, at the University of Illinois, and I got to know him, got to talk to him. And I said, why don't you come meet me? And so he, I said, put, put him on for me, he came out. I said, dude, he's kind of like living in Finland and bumming around and sort of taking a sabbatical. And I said, why don't you come out and work with us at interview? So the first thing he does when he comes out, I love this, he goes, he goes, what are you trying to solve? And I said, well, we're trying to do these rotations and quaternions and multi-coordinate systems and translations and translating between coordinate systems. And uh, in the text of the conversation, the guy, I was going, you know, I was, in, I was an engineer at Cal, and I, I, you know, this is my background, a little bit of what I've done. And he goes, uh, why do engineers take calculus? Why do they learn in calculus? I love that. Because I love calculus, but I just never really used much of it when I got out of when I graduated. So, anyways, to go backwards again, uh, I, I moved from, from working with Alan to do some pattern factor automation stuff, and then migrated into gaming and migrated into controllers and control systems. I went to Microsoft, Electronic Arts, Activision, a bunch of other companies, just sort of odd jobbing it. If I got tired of what I was doing or bored with it, I'd split. I'd do something else. And um, in the meantime, I'm, I'm getting these ideas on patents. You know, I want to patent something. I want to do this thing here. I think this really cool idea for doing this multi-input thing. Light gun, I want to patent the light gun. So I start writing patents. And uh, it's just expensive, by the way, if you pay some attorney to do it. So I did it anyways. And um, I got to know the inventing world quite a bit. And I met other inventors and, and other engineers who did inventions. And I and, uh, got to know a, sort of a network of people, and I stayed in touch with them for a long time. And, and um, so uh, I moved into gaming. Um, I was moderately interested in it, not thrilled with it. Um, but I was very good at it and programming, mostly on the console side and middleware, firmware. And uh, so because of my digital hardware background, I wrote the accelerator for the graphics systems and hacked into the consoles. I hacked a, the Wii mode controller and hacked the Wii console, reverse engineered that, reverse engineered the PS2 and the, some of the PS3, mostly the PS2. And so, uh, because of my knowledge of the consoles and how the GP, the GP is the entire electronics system, I just, I just had to know, when I went to understand something, I had to know everything. I couldn't just be happy doing one little part of it. So I ended up, uh, that skill set was high value, it turns out, because when game, we started doing gaming, I mean, we ran into these limitations with the, the console suppliers' middleware, but it just wasn't fast enough, so we had to like rewrite it. And so I worked, um, got so good at that, reversing that stuff that a company heard about me. And this, I, one day I get this call, and this guy goes, you're Jack, right? I go, yeah, that's me. And he goes, we heard you're really good at fixing problems with PS2. And I said, well, I'm not. I go, what do you need me to do? And he goes, well, we got a problem with synchronizing the video with the sound um, and we've got these other problems, and we want to build this controller and manufacture it, and, and can you do that? And I said, yeah, I can do most of that. And I was all, come talk to him, so I go talk to this guy. And in the meantime, I'd working at Take Two, which is uh, kind of a big company, but I go to talk to this guy, and he goes, I've got this really cool idea, and he goes, it's a plastic guitar, and we take this plastic guitar, and we're going to write music around it. And it wasn't even his idea. It was a Japanese company that did that, but it was Jake Pop, and it was terrible. Um, <laughs> so we took that plastic guitar from another game and then wrote a demo game around it and took the plastic guitar and took it over the prize. There was like five people in the company. And uh, there was a line of people out the door to play because it was fun. And uh, I, I was trying to figure out for the longest time what people liked about it. And certainly the music's part of it, but really I thought the part of it was the fact that it's very difficult to play guitar. It's not an easy instrument to learn. It takes years and years to get good at it. And you could do it in a year and a half or two years and get competent, but to be at an expert level takes 15, 20 years. And what I think people really admire is the fact that you can pick this thing up and sound it and act like an expert. That's my take on it. And, uh, and so I built this plastic guitar and then worked with the, directly with the studio Microsoft Studio in LA to integrate the game, fix all the console problems, fix problems with the Xbox, and to get this thing in production. So we thought we'd do like 
maybe, you know, the first version, maybe 100,000, 200,000, but it was like 12 million. And, you know, when you make that many of something, you're going to have a very short cash crisis. And if you're going to make that many of something, it's a huge amount of money. It's hundreds of millions of dollars, which we didn't have. So we went out seeking, um, my boss, who's the CEO, went out seeking a uh, company to acquire us so that we get the capital to produce the game. And we did. That was Activision. They bought us. And they bought my company, or part of my company, an asset acquisition, a home business. And um, so we went from that guitar to the next version, the next version, the next version. We had the drums, we had synth inside the drums, a MIDI synthesizer. I added all this stuff in there that no one ever used, but except for strange hackers on YouTube. I kind of like that. Thing. So after that, I, uh, I finished up there and I went to. Uh, on my own for a couple of years, just kind of bumming around. I worked on a camera remote for GoPro. Worked on some other, I reverse engineered the GoPro camera. GoPro Hero HD2. Reverse that. Packed into it and reversed it. Found out how it worked, found out how the user interface worked, how the boss interface worked, how the firmware works. And then, um, what did I do? I ended up writing, writing a remote control for it and trying to rewrite the firmware for the camera. It's very, a very weird thing. It's, it's Single SOC, and uh, I found the, uh, the hack into the back end of it, pulled all the code, so the code out. It was not protected. They put the thing in production without locking the code in. So I got the code out and disassembled it. <laughs> and I was done. But um, you know, when you do something like that, it's really hard to get make a product out of it. But I was very, very interested in the camera. And it was JTAG, JTAG, JTAG interface. So. Um, I'm doing that, and then I I got injured in an accident. And was hanging around and doing stuff, and kind of kicking back. And along comes Palmer uh, Lucky, and oh my damn thing crashed on me here. Stop working. Along comes Palmer Lucky and Brennan Uribe and a couple other people at Octopus, and they walked in and they said, you know, this is going to change the world. I said, yeah, change the world. And, no, we're serious. We think this is this is it. This is it. Holy grail. Okay. <laughs> Palmer has this. Palmer's a really smart kid. I'm a very creative guy. Uh, he's a nice guy too. A very really good guy. And I liked him so. And I liked Brendan. And um, the other guys were okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, he said, uh, you know, we heard from Activision you can take something and make it. And I said, you heard wrong. And I don't want to make that. I don't want anything to do with it. And uh, I thought that anyways. What's well, another funny story is Palmer's 19. And, you know, he's, he's my son's age. My oldest son's age. He comes into my studio. I have a studio. And puts his feet up on my furniture. He's eating pizza. And I'm looking, talking to him. I'm looking at his feet on my table. And I'm going, he's got to get his feet off my table. He's biting me. So I, I said to him, get your feet off my table. He goes, oh, OK. And, but uh, Palmer uh, had this contraption, and he had made it out of foam core board, which is stuff you buy at Walgreens. And uh, these lenses he found on eBay, and a display he found on eBay, and a display controller he found on eBay, and an IMU that he got from Carmack, John. And um, they cobbled it together. Um, Carmack started modifying a game for it, an application. We had actually had an application, very difficult to get this to work on PC. It's, it's a challenge, challenging thing. And uh, Carmack was working on that. He's the best guy in the world. <coughs> he is. He's the best, one of the best programmers around. And um, we had Brendan doing the business stuff. And Brendan is very good at that, in sales. And so we started working on this thing. And uh, we did Kickstarter. You guys heard of Kickstarter, right? For sure. Yeah. Did Kickstarter. We did sold about 8,000 of them or something. We did about 2.4 million. Still didn't have enough capital for the company, and um, so we borrowed some. We got an investment uh, from Series A investment that got us over the pump. We did our Series B, and um, with Series B we got really over the hump. But we were growing so rapidly, where it was a cash situation. And when you're going to make this thing is expensive, and you're going to make you know. 50,000, 60,000 of them, do the math, they're going to cost $150 a piece to make. And you very quickly can calculate that's a huge amount of money. Millions of, tens of millions of dollars. And we had to have a 
partner in China that they're willing to take on the risk with us because then we could put this on the market and it could have failed pretty badly. Um, so we put it out there and the sales were really good. And we had a lot of good press and good spin. And it's really cool. I mean, it was really, it's really fun. It's a really interesting experience. So uh, along comes uh, some issues with it. I mean, you've probably heard of some of them. Um, we need to fix those. A vestibular illness, some other things. Um, we're working on we're working on fixing those, and we think we've come pretty close with this. Not perfect, but it's a lot better than the first one we did. And um, this one is a, uses positional tracking, and, but there's also an IMU. Who knows what an IMU is? You know what I'm talking about? It's a compass. Essentially, it's a compass, and it's got a gyroscope and accelerometer, magnetometer, and from those nine axes, you develop. A coordinate system that the game can understand. You send that coordinate system those readings down into the computer here. The game takes those readings and then orients them into the plane, into the three D space that you're in. Um, there's some problems with it. I mean, it can't do translation. For instance, if I'm doing this in a movie at a steady rate, the gyroscope's outputting zero, the accelerometer's outputting zero. I'm not accelerating, right? And then in the process of moving through space. Sometimes you stop accelerating, you know your body moving. And the gyroscope's saying, you're zero, and the accelerometer says, you're just one G. Well, that's a problem if you lose, you're integrating across the spectrum and you lose position, right? So, we fix that with a camera. The camera on here is some tracking LEDs inside of here, and it's a lot better. But I think the CD1 version, the new version is even better. Um, so what happened with this thing is it took off um, pretty, pretty, pretty well, and um, and what I intend to do is to bring you guys up here and try it to try it. Um, and I I think what I was telling someone today I think what this is going to reveal to the world is is not I mean not such a great profound experience which it is but that there's a lot we don't know about how the brain interprets the world we have in front of us and those shortcomings. <coughs> Of this thing, which you know, to explain to somebody, I think there's an issue with scaling. When you look at something that's up close, it's in a different scale frame in your brain than it is when you're looking at the room. But when you're representing things in 3D, 2D space, that's why stereopsis that can't be translated properly. And I think that may be a core of why this thing just we have to fix that. Don't know how to fix it right now. Um, but I've had a really good career, and I, you know, on Cal helping. Uh, kick it off, at least help me get my first job. Introduced me to L1 Roadcam and uh, got me a, my first real engineering job. Does anyone know what a PID move is? It's going to control people. So I have a little background in fuzzy logic. And I remember trying to fix a problem with a bike I was working on years ago. There was some firmware in it, and it was like 8051 or something like that. And I could not get the loop stabilized. I couldn't, it would oscillate, especially when I put the brakes on it, because you're, you're using a dynamic brake, which is an electric brake. So I said, there's got to be a way to do this. It's so stupid to do this with this integral, you know, using calculus to do this thing. It's a you know, triple order differential equation, or whatever it was. So I started reading the stuff, and I go to the library at Berkeley, and I said, there's a professor here that's not done this stuff. His name is like Zeta or something. I'm going to go find his paper, read his paper. Oh, that's not, that's a really weird way of approaching things. Huh. So I started writing, I wrote some fuzzy logic control for this thing, that worked. I didn't go anywhere in the market, it was a disaster. But it was an interesting experience. So I sort of, in my way of looking at things, and especially the way I was taught here by a few people, it's like, you don't have to use this approach, you can you know, create your own approach. And that's the way I always did it. I always sort of, just wanted to do it my way, so I just do things my way. And it wasn't actually my way, I learned it from other people. But Another thing was, uh, another control problem was that when I was working on that film system, which is actually on Terminator 2, it's one of the phrase of Terminator 2 years ago, but we had to clock these pixels off, and there were rows of exposed pixels exposed right on the phone as ones and zeros, right? So black or white, depending on the state. And so we had in the film when it's moving through the projector skews just very slightly. So you get these pixels coming in. They're all coming in, but they're kind of like offset in line. So what 
all we did was embed a clock phase in there. It was clocking. It was a hidden clock in there, so you could clock it in and out. And then have to go into all this hardware use of VGAs, and it's really high speed hardware for the day. It's not very high. I suppose I have three megahertz, which is it's pretty slow. Uh, but what I learned from, from him, he is my professor here, was he didn't use a GID but he didn't use any kind of calculus to do it. It was a game. I mean, he had this pinwheel thing. I saw I remember looking at it. And and <coughs> He, he had lined it up like this. He was a genius. This guy was, he was a really, really, really smart guy. Had lined it up and he encoded the states in this pinwheel and it had these concentric rings with different states. And I never understood it. <laughs> so I just coded it. You know, I said, okay, I got, I'll just code it that way. And that thing worked. I mean, I had to tweak it. But that's the kind of approach that I take to things. I think I pretty much learned that here. So um, I'm done talking about myself. And um, I appreciate you guys showing up. Um, what I would, I have one other question. This is, I talked to myself about this. Does anyone know the single greatest contributor to the, victor, the victory we had in World War II is who it was? Does anyone know who that is? Murray? Yeah. Alan Turing, a mathematician. He, 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 he uh, cracked the coding system. And, and I don't know how you do. You know how we did it? Using the massive in the uh, NIAC computers. Or, it, was it was actually a, it was a machine he built. Yeah. Uh, no, that was in that was in Princeton. This was not. This was another one that they built in England. Yeah, but he all he did was like make a machine that could actually take the instruction off tape and then write it back to tape. So he would take and he made and so to crack the enigma, he just made fifty of those things running in parallel, really, really fast. I mean, that's how we did it, basically. And then he had these strings that they called them strings of like Admiral, you know, they were spelling for Admiral seven characters. And he would see these patterns go by. Of course, they were different numbers every time, different letters, rather. And he would use that as his crib, as the seed crib. And then he would just get these, this uh, massive computer, it was kind of a computer thing, a state machine running those things, that crib there, in sequences and different. That's, that's how they did it. They brute forced it. In fact, it was impossible to crack. I'm not sure if I have all that right, but I, that's what I read. You also, if you hit like A, it would never show up as A. So you no, it had had rotors. Yeah. And the, the U boat, the, the submarines had four rotors, and the, the ground troops had three. So, anyways, very difficult thing to crack. Um, yeah, and it had lights. It was a very simple thing. There's no transistors in it, nothing. It's just some lights on a board. Just keys, and you push the key and roll, take the rotor to the next position. And then the next key you hit would rotate the second rotor to a new position, so it was never lined up. But if you knew the starting position, and you knew what was in the input, it could actually decode it. So, but they never knew the starting position. So, anyways, I always liked that story uh, that he, this guy, you know, quirky guy, actually was able to transform the world pretty much by just thinking his way through it. So, I don't have anything else. Did you do it? Yeah, sure. First question. Yes. You raise your hand. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in talking about reverse engineering uh, technology, and I was, I was kind of curious. I was a member of sort of like you know, think about kind of concern that other people are going to be able to reverse engineer things you produce and how. It, well, the way the most countries' legal systems look at reverse engineering, it varies from country to country. In the U.S., taking a device and reverse engineering it and making a copy of it is not illegal to do that. I never really did anything like that, but I mostly did that for hacking. Like I like to hack into things, like break stuff, break in. I like doing that. I just did it as a hobby. So, um, on the camera, um, GoPro, I reversed that. I took this, ripped the source code out of it, and wrote a disassembly report and reversed it. And uh, I did that for my own fun. And I wanted to learn about how the camera worked. So, um, how would I feel if some, I would be honored if someone <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had that happen yet. Uh, 
And the Wiimote, we reverse engineer the Wiimote by uh, finding uh, uh, mechanism to get inside of it. And when I went to Nintendo in Japan, I was working with Kyoto, and I go, hey, look what I found. Their engineer is the guy that built the Wiimote. Was there, and he goes, I go, I gotta show you this. You know, we found this way into your Wiimote, and we can actually see the entire memory map of it. He goes, really? He goes, let me see that. He walks out, he goes, try it now. He had changed it. <laughs> <laughs> All future remotes can, you can't hack into. <laughs> um, you know, I, I had a, a cultural uh, problem with um, working at Oculus, um, in a way, because all guys are in their 20s. And, uh, you know, they have 3D printers. And these new things that I never had, I just make the stuff by hand. If I needed to make the shape I do at Palmer did, you know, just shape it. Um, yeah, but I, I have a more open mind now than I did before in terms of those kinds of things. And I have new ways of doing things like the maker culture. Um, I don't know what we call that, but we didn't have a name for that, but there were a lot of people doing that that we didn't know here. Well, we knew about each other, we didn't know what we were. Um, and uh, I'm reversing the consoles and the reverse I reverse engineered NTFS too, which is his file system, encrypted file system. And I did that because of writing drivers for the file system, and someone paid me to, to do that. They paid me to put a piece of software on there. And uh, the reverse engineer the, uh, the Western Digital Drive for another company. Just, that's what I like to do, to take things apart like that. On the innovative side, I can also do that because I've learned from those things. When I take things apart, I go, why do you do that that way? I would never do that that way. Next time I had the opportunity to do something, I wouldn't do it that way, I'd do it anyway. Um, so, uh, I understand the simplicity of the Dark Hero and how that helps people, or how that's the feature that people like. Yeah. But did you ever consider designing it in a way that it would, it would help people to learn actually how to play guitar? Is, did that cross your mind? You know, um, people did do that, but you can't really play chords on it. There's only, you know, there's five buttons on it and a strum bar. I suppose, and I saw, I saw some stuff on, on YouTube like that. People had written some software. On the drums, though, you put a MIDI synthesizer in it. It's got MIDI in and MIDI out. So you can take the drums and run a MIDI cable to a synth, like a chord synth or a Yamaha drum synth, and play the drums on it. We did that intentionally, so we thought that people would get a hold of that and find new uses for it. Um, the drums were different. That was an actual real music, musical instrument. It did play notes. Um, and, but the guitar, no. Uh, the guitar was a plastic thing. We had to make the thing for eight or nine dollars. It was eight dollars for the whole thing. So we had to you know, do a very cost-effective design and make sure that it fit the market. The drums, we had more latitude, they were more expensive than they were going to be anyway. It's a very big piece of plastic. Um, but there are people on YouTube who did just that. Hi, um, I was wondering, <coughs> as far as like seeking of innovation, what do you see as like, the future of virtual reality in like, the next five to ten years? As I said, I, I don't know. I, look, I don't know where that's going to go, but I think this thing will reveal about human perception. I think that would be its greatest contribution. That we'll, we'll finally get really understand how to view the world and how your eyes view the world. It's disassociative to where this for a long time you, you and I can run a demo for you if I can do the same thing. Let me know where you're sitting at a desk and, and you feel like I'm going to reach out and touch the cup, but you're hitting something here. It's just very eerie. Um, uh, so, I don't know where it's going to go. Where, it depends upon where the base takes it, and not those guys take it. Um, it would be really cool to be able to put these things on and talk to your girlfriend or boyfriend or wife or whatever in a different country in real time and see them physically there in 3D. Mm -hmm. I think that would be cool. It would be a really good social experience. Yeah. Again, I don't know what Facebook intends to do with it. Um, First, I like to play racing games with it. There's a couple of them online. I've tried them. They don't run on this machine here. It's not powerful enough. But getting into a cockpit and then you know, seeing your environment, and seeing your you know, competitors and the track, and then it's really it's a short term job. I, I don't know what the answer to that is. I'm sorry. Thank you.
Hi. So um, what I'm wondering is, you, simulation sickness, they've, they've said that it's largely solved by the positional tracking, by the low persistence, by uh, all the features that you've been working on. And I've also heard it said that the screen door is mostly eliminated in the Crescent Bay prototype. So what I wonder is, what do you see as the, the remaining big issues that you have to solve before you can release the consumer version of the Rift? <laughs> you touched on an area where I can't really talk about, in, and I don't have the greatest depth of knowledge what is actually going on there, to be honest with you. So, okay. um, you can imagine that it, there's a great impetus to solve simulation sickness and the screen door stuff. It's much less noticeable on this one than on DK1. Mm -hmm. In DK1, I put that thing on and just go, oh, you know, I always see a screen in front of me. We tried playing with the focal lengths and all kinds of yep. things we played with, but it's just hard to fix that. And by the way, what demos are you running? I'm running um, a planetarium demo because it's an education thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only one that runs on here really well, except it crash, right? Now. It says uh, unexpected application error. <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, so uh, obviously it was a good idea to um, merge with Facebook so that you can get your product in the hands of more users or more consumers. Um, so why did you choose Facebook over some other big tech company? What do you see? What do what can they offer that like the other big companies uh, do not? Well, in the case of other ventures I've worked on, let's say you have a success. Your thing is successful. And you have $100 in the bank and you didn't need to make $10,000 of them. Where do you get that? Where would you get the money? Well, you can go get funding for this money. But it's maybe $100 million that may not be enough. You're in a constant position of going out and finding. I mean, this is my take on it from a business perspective. So you get uh, large resources. Um, and since when I was acquired by Activision, I got all that massive resources to work with that I never had before. Um, I never had the time to sit down and hack stuff because I had to make a living, too. You know, people don't pay you to hack things. They do, but um, most people like that you don't work for. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so to answer your question, I mean, you know, if you're going to be an entrepreneurial type, you really have to think about the business part of it. It's very important. I see this stuff go up on Kickstarter, and I look at it, and I go, you know, you're I mean, where are you going to a watch? You're going to make an electronic watch, and where are you going to get the money to do that? I mean, you know, you've got $2 million, that's like 5% of what you need, or 2%. And uh, so I think what a partner like that offers you is the resources and technical resources. Facebook, people are shut. And, uh, for whatever reason, I mean, it's a cool idea to have a screen with information flowing into your brain. I don't know what happened there. And Google will never hire me now, just saying. <laughs> um, what are you doing now, and what's the roadmap for the next like, two to five years? Well, I, so I'm building a, um, I bought a bunch of machinery, and big machinery, and I bought um, 3D printers, an object 500, and SC, I forget the name. I bought some 3D printers, big 3D printers, a polymer print, liquid polymer printer, a feed printer, and a 5-axis CNC um, with a huge bed. And I've got a bunch of electronic equipment, and I'm going to use that. But I'm going to use it in a way that the group here at Berkeley is using it. I'm going to invite people in to come and create stuff, because I have the capital and resources to, to do that now. I wanted to do something like that, but I, you know, it's again, you're sprinting, and you got to eat and pay for your room, right, your car. So I can do that now. And work on some other startup stuff. Can you say a little bit more about what makes the Oculus different from earlier headsets that did virtual reality? You mentioned that idea, but beyond that. So, so uh, what makes this thing work is our high pitch, high density displays and MEMS devices, which are low cost. You know, 25 years ago, a gyroscope cost $40,000. 
now it's 70 cents or 50 cents or something. It's very inexpensive. A screen like this never existed before mobile phones. Mobile phones drove the screen. Well, I take that back. They did it for cameras and things, but they were like out of your reach. This is, these are screens, screen technology from mobile phones. So um, that's what made it happen, because all of a sudden we have these this collusion of this you know, polymer and then these other things happening, and just all sort of working at once. Here's a sweet spot. I wanted to ask, how do you prefer to think of yourself over here? Uh, as a designer, or as an engineer, or as a hacker? Well, uh, you know, um, I told you about my background. I'm not a, I was not a great student. Even at Berkeley, I was kind of like average. I got the work done. Going to class was a problem for me. I just could not go to class. Couldn't stand to sit there for an hour. I couldn't. So, um, you know, uh, I uh, I'm a creative guy. I started out as an artist. That's what I am. I like to create stuff. I gotta get. I gotta do that constantly. I built cars and all kinds of stuff in my history. So. Um, that's just what drives me. And seeing seeing something that you're working on out of the wool, I really get a rush off that. That's better than I could be gotta be better than any drug just to see what you've worked on for go out into the wool and be used by people. And Guitar Hero, you know, he sold fifty million of those things. It's a lot. That's like fifty container ships or something ridiculous full of them. It's a lot of pieces of hardware. And you get it in that many people's hands. That I like that. On the hacking stuff, I just do that for fun. And uh, a couple of those hacking projects I was paid to do, and but I, I mostly do that because I like doing it. And I just like it's like can't get a, a disk drive maker that is still around. Um, you know, left some stupid stuff on their disk drive, and I found it, and uh, I just was astonished by that. Um, but it allowed me to get into Windows and run in Windows without Windows ever knowing it was an application running. That's stuff I like. Any last questions? Yes. Okay, so, um, yeah, thank you for everyone for all that great question and thanks guys for coming. Very long. So, information as they get closer. Um, so right now let's go. Yeah, do you want to have people still so close? Yeah, so um, the demo will be happening here, so everyone can start lining up. And, um, yeah, I, hope it, I hope it runs. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. We work with them, but we're I'm not necessarily part of this. Oh, ready? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Palmer Lucky at the first Oculus event. <laughs> got his pants and jumped in the pool. <laughs> like a 23 year old, like, co founder. Why? Why? Because he was just like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I think he was drunk. Wait, 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 where were you? Um, so I wasn't, I wasn't at this. I was video chatting with Angel and Russell, who were currently at it. Yeah. And then they were like, Palmer Lucky just jumped in the pool. <laughs> What event was it, or it was a... It's the Oculus Connect. It's the, it was their, it's like the first VR conference. Oh, wow. Wow. It happened. Was it like a party, or like, you just like... I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it oh. was like a, it was a conference. Uh, yeah. Ready? 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 Ready?